Well, good morning, venue. It's good to see you this morning. I want to welcome you guys once again. Uh, We're kicking off our Christmas series today. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, We're going to land here for a couple of uh, weeks this year at the Christmas season. In case I haven't met you yet, my name's Curtis Barnes. I'm the discipleship pastor here at uh, Geyer Springs. I work with our Sunday school, small groups, and then also oversee our age-graded staff and do our marriage and family-related stuff. And so it's a pleasure and honor. I've been here almost 10 years now, just finishing year nine, starting year 10. So it's been a great time and we're thankful for this body. Well, we are going to talk today, Isaiah chapter nine, kind of set the context and sort of give you a roadmap for our next four weeks during the Christmas season. So if you wanna mark this passage, this verse, spend a little time doing some research, some study on your own, that's great, Would, would invite you to do that. And as we think about context, let's kind of understand what's going on in Isaiah chapter nine. Some of you may remember, we've been talking about Joseph for the last several months and talking about uh, Israel's 12 sons uh, who became the nation of Israel. Well, sometimes as siblings do, they had a little conflict with one another. And when this happened, the 10 uh, siblings got together and they made a nation. They called themselves, they kept the name Israel. So 10 of those siblings were Israel and they were considered the northern part of that. Well, the other two the, uh, from the 12 split off and they became a smaller nation of just two of them. And they were known as the nation of Judah. So you had Israel and Judah. Well, Isaiah is prophesying to Judah, the, the two in the, in the southern kingdom, and he's telling them, what's gonna happen. He's warning and he's pleading with them. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, you're not following God and God's gonna punish you because of your sin. So over half of Isaiah's book is that message, that warning, turn back to God because sin, or he's gonna punish your sin. Now it's not like it's this half of the book and then these other sections. So he spends about half the book warning them and telling them that if they don't turn from their sins, this army's gonna come in from the north, which has already conquered those northern uh, siblings in Israel and it's gonna conquer them as well. So he warns them and warns them and warns them. But Isaiah knows people, He knows what's gonna happen, God has shown him. So about another third of his book, he's telling them, when you get carried off into captivity, because that's where they're gonna go, here's how you should respond. And the number one message is, repent of your sins and turn back to God, and he will rescue you, he will set you free. He knows what's gonna happen, he's predicting these people are gonna come in, so turn back to God when you're in captivity. And then the final 10% or so of Isaiah's book is prophecy that's looking to the future. He's telling them you're gonna be in captivity, but God's gonna set you free. And then after he sets you free, these things are gonna happen. Some of which we're gonna talk about today are 700 years. Isaiah's prophesying about 700 BC. He's gonna talk about a child that's gonna be born some 700 years later. And then the other part of his prediction for the future is all the way out to the end times when Jesus returns. And so he's got this prophetic nature in his book. And so we're gonna look today at some of this prophecy toward this uh, child that's gonna come in about 700 years. Thinking about a 700 year time period, any of you like to wait? Any of you just like, man, I just love to wait. Let me sit in traffic. I love just being in a doctor's office, not doing anything, you know, had an appointment at nine, it's 10, 15. I'm great with that. Anybody? That's what I thought. I read an article this week. There are professional waiters, not like wait staff at a restaurant, people who will go and wait for you in line at attractions in New York City. You pay them money, they'll go stand in line, get your ticket, you show up, they give it and you go on in. I'm like, not in a thousand years. No way would I do that. And it's Christmas season, so you may remember being a kid, you may have kids, you know the anticipation of what Christmas is like. How many of you celebrate your Christmas morning events before the sun rises, anybody? Oh yeah, yeah, I I was that kid growing up. We we still do that today, mine are older now, We, we have all the Christmas stuff and we go back to bed for four more hours. It's awesome as I get a little bit older. If you are 10 and under in the room, would you stand up for me just a second? If you are 10 years old or under, stand up for me just a second. All right, good representation of your day. Any of you excited that Christmas is coming? Anybody? We got some excitement here. Any of you excited that it's still 22 days away? Anybody wish it was tomorrow? 
Yeah, yeah. Look, this is what we did at my house growing up. We, we had, uh, for our kids, we had this countdown to Christmas. It's got the 25 days of Christmas on here. We've got these little Christmassy magnets and they get on here, they put them up every day. The first thing they would do when they got out of bed is run and then argue about whose day it was or which magnet they were going to put on and they would mark off the days. So we've got three days gone. We're at December. We have 22, we called it more sleeps. We had 22 more sleeps until Christmas is here. Any of you wish it was tomorrow instead of 22 days? Yeah, 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 a bunch of you are doing that. Well, how about this? How many of you would like to wait 700 years for Christmas? No, what? what? He said, what? Like, no way, 700 years? Nobody wants to do that. But that's what the people of Israel were doing. Isaiah is speaking of one who was to come and it was gonna be 700 years into the future. So let's read what Isaiah says about this one who is to come some 700 years in the future. We're in Isaiah chapter nine, verse one, he starts and he says, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish in the former time. So he's looking back, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. So what he's saying here is the anguish, the pain that came to Israel came from the north. These two tribes are in the north and that's where that invading army was coming from. But that was in the past. Now he's looking to the future. He says, but in the latter time, he has made glorious. Look at that word. He has made glorious. He's going to do something incredible. Uh, the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. And so God is going to do something glorious and it's going to come from the area of Galilee, the, from the direction of the sea. Verse two is, it tells about their experience. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them, light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. And here he talks about the victory of this one. He, he's going to bring victory, great victory. Look at what he says in verse four. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. This is a reference to when God set his people free. He says, for every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. What he's saying there is there will be no necessity for any things, any weapons of war, any gear for war. He's gonna take and burn all that because there's gonna be peace. He's gonna defeat the enemy so thoroughly that there'll be no more, no more war. They'll use that stuff as fire, as fuel for a fire. And here's our focal verse in verse, verse six. For to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And that government doesn't mean a political government. It means the responsibility of governing, of ruling, of leading his people. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And let's look at this final description and come back to verse uh, six. It says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So we see these descriptors in verse six of this one who is to come. We're gonna spend the next four weeks looking at these names these descriptions of Jesus. Isaiah gives us a few right here. Here's an awesome gift that Mary and Joseph got in addition to the baby Jesus. God named their baby. Parents in the room, can I get an amen on the task of naming your children? Oh my word, if you've got family names to consider, you know, if you're a junior or a third or whatever, you gotta put that in the equation. You gotta think about, did I date one of these? Did my spouse date one of these in the past? Was that a good experience? You gotta think about, you know, middle school rhyming for your kids when they, when they get to middle school. Then you gotta do the language stuff of what does this mean in other language? I mean, nobody wants your kid coming home from school going, did you know that in Swahili, my name means elephant rump or whatever, you know, kind of stuff. So. You got all of this stuff to do. And if you have married an educator, then God bless your soul. Shelly was a teacher. And when we were trying to name Caleb, our firstborn, I'd bring up a name. And if they've had one in class and if it wasn't a good experience in class, oh my, Shelly, what about Todd? 
Oh, no, 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 no. I had Todd and he was a terror and there was nothing holy about his terror, right? You know, kind of thing. I'm like, well, what about a Winston? She's like, nope, three months of therapy for Winston, you know, kind of stuff. No offense to Todd's or Winston's in the room, by the way, you know, on that. I mean, we struggled coming up with a name. I thought Caleb's birth certificate was gonna say he who could not be named, right? You know, kind of deal. And then you get the middle name and how all that fits together. True story, our third child, Daniel, we'd settled on Daniel was gonna be his name and we're working on that middle name thing. What flows, what sounds good? Daniel Andrew Barnes, Daniel Mitchell Barnes. So we're driving down the road doing this out loud. Daniel Andrew, Daniel Mitchell, Daniel Jedediah, you know, just kind of whatever. And from the back seat, six-year-old Caleb says, Daniel Zachary. And Shelly and I were like, Daniel Zachary, Daniel Zachary. So we got, we're like, that works for us. You know, we're just we're like, hey, whatever. So literally, Daniel's six-year-old brother gave him his middle name, all right? So man, Mary and Joseph, the angels, Isaiah speaks these names. The angels came and said, you will call his name Jesus. And he defined, because he will save his people from their sins. You'll call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And here in Isaiah, we see that Isaiah is also giving these titles these names, these descriptors of Jesus, this one who was, who was to come. And look, we get this. We realize these are names of descriptions of Jesus, not like his daily use names, right? I mean, it wasn't like, hey, wonderful, go feed the dogs, right? You know, wonderful, did you get your room cleaned up? This isn't how they were talking about that. Hey, you know, counselor, dinner's ready, you know, come on in. Or counselor, don't talk back to me. See what I did with the counselor, but anyway. These are descriptions of Jesus that tell us his nature. They tell us the character of Jesus. They give us a picture of what God is like. And more than just a picture, we get the movie of what God is like. Do you wanna know what God is like? Do you wanna know what God thinks about people? You look at Jesus' life, his work, his ministry, you see God interacting with people because Jesus was God, fully God, fully human. We get this understanding of who God is. And so today we're gonna to look at these two words that describe Jesus. He is a wonderful counselor. So here's what we're going to do. Let's, let's look, talk about this word wonderful. And we need to understand that when we study the Bible, sometimes here's what we do. We hear a word in English and we think about the English definition. We're like, oh, that, that's what that means. But guys, that's studying it backward. We don't take our English word and put it on what scripture teaches. We need to reverse that process. So I'm going to give you a little tool for that. You're like, I didn't go to school. I don't know how to do that. There's a great app, which is a good starting point called the Blue Letter Bible. So I think it's going to come up on the screen here. You can see this. You can go to your app store, Google Play store. Uh, it's called the Blue Letter Bible. You can, if you download it now, don't play with it. All right, listen to the rest of the sermon. You can do that this afternoon. But when you do the Blue Letter Bible, set it up. You, this is the app. You go to the book, chapter, or verse, all the books of the Bible. So we're in Isaiah 9. So you'll see this screen come up. It says Isaiah chapter 9 right here. And on the number 6 there, you see that verse. Anywhere on that verse, you can click on it. A little yellow, you click on that dot. It's going to then take you to this screen, which will give you this list of resources. These are all free that are on there. You can pay and add some. But if you click on that interlinear concordance, the concordance is like a Bible dictionary. It tells you the definition of a word and how it's used in Scripture. This screen will come up and you're like, what does that mean? You don't understand all that stuff, that's okay. You're looking for that word wonderful right there. If you'll click on that number and letter with the yellow dot there, this screen will come up and it's gonna tell you the outline of how this word, what it means, how it's used in the Bible. So we see these, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. And if you scroll down on that screen, you keep going, you'll come to this next screen. This will show you every other place in the Bible that this word is used and how it's translated in that place, okay? So when we study the Bible, rather than take our English word and read it back into it, we need to see what the word meant to the author, to the audience who heard it. We understand what they knew the word as, then we can apply it to where we are today. Because we hear the word wonderful, and the word wonderful today means we're happy about something. Something is pleasant. It, it, it's likable in some way. Hey, I got, a, I got a promotion at work. Well, that's wonderful. I, I'm thrilled for you. We say, you know, Blue House opened back up. I went this week. They've got a new dish, and it is wonderful, 
right? Yeah, so we're, yeah, we had this wonderful new dish, but you got to get it uh, other days than Sunday or Monday, right? Because they're closed. But that's how we use the word wonderful. But in the Bible, if you'll go back to that screen on there, when you look at that word, that term that's in there, the word wonderful in the Bible means something that is extraordinary. The word wonderful in the Bible actually means that something, it's a hard to understand thing. It's so uh, magnificent. It's so, so wonderful. It's beyond our comprehension. We're not even to fully grasp it. You can see that we wonder or we marvel at God's acts of judgment or of God's redemption. And so this description here in Isaiah chapter nine is of Jesus saying that Jesus is going to be beyond our comprehension that he is extraordinary, he is spectacular. He's so far beyond all that we can imagine that we can, our minds can't even fully grasp everything about him as he functions in a very specific way, which is as what? The counselor. This word is actually used in the, in the book of Judges, chapter 13, the angel comes to tell Samson's parents that they're gonna have a baby uh, that's gonna be born. And Samson's dad says to the angel, what is your name so that we may honor you when your words come true? And the angel said, why do you ask my name? The angel of the Lord asked, since it is beyond understanding. That beyond understanding means my name is wonderful. It's too much for you to grasp. And so Jesus is this wonderful, this hard to grasp. We can't even fully understand. He's a wonderful counselor. So what does counselor mean in the Bible? Well, if you use that blue letter app, the blue letter Bible app, follow the same thing. A counselor is gonna tell you uh, are these things. A counselor is one who is given to advise. In the Bible, someone gives counsel, a counselor is there to advise. Uh, it is someone to consult, go and seek their opinion, their, their input. They will give counsel, give instructions, give ideas, give thoughts. A counselor in the Bible is referenced as someone who will help you find or give purpose to something. They will help you devise, they will help you plan. So that's how the term counselor is used in the Bible. Once we understand that, we can say Jesus as the wonderful counselor meets us in our life to give us counsel, to help us devise and to plan and to, help, to find purpose and meaning. And Jesus comes from a place of doing this with authority. You may meet with the counselor and they can listen, they can be great and give great empathetic responses and help you work through some possible solutions to some things. But here's one thing that your counselor today is not going to know, what the future holds and how things are gonna turn out. They don't know that, that they are limited human beings. But in the wonderful counselor, Jesus knows. Think about that, Jesus knows, he knows you. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your past. He knows the hurt and the pain that you've been through. He knows where you're struggling. And you may put on a great face and come to church and go, oh, things are great. Jesus knows that that's not the case. But not only does he know, he understands and he meets us where we are. We're gonna see a verse about that in just a moment. Jesus meets us where we are. He's been through what we go through. And then Jesus knows the future. He knows the plans, he knows the purposes, he knows what God wants to do and is able to do in and through your life. And you can come to this wonderful counselor and he knows all those things and he will help you, meet you where you are and give you what you need for the future. This verse is very, very important as we think about that. It's Hebrews chapter four and it says of Jesus, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Man, look at that and underscore that. Jesus is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. He knows, he understands, he, he meets us there. And it says, but we have one who in every respect, circle, underline, highlight those words, every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. And because we have this Jesus to connect to, look at what he says will be our experience then. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. 
Guys, that's a reference to God himself, the throne of grace. God sits there, could pour out judgment because of our sin, but instead we receive, we receive grace and mercy uh, because of his love for us. The throne of grace that we may look at these words, receive mercy, find grace to do what? To help. And look at that verse. Jesus is there. He wants to help. That's why he's available. That's why he came to help in need. And we see this picture of Jesus. And I love how one author thinking about Jesus as the wonderful counselor, he put it this way. Jesus has the experience to understand our situation. As a wonderful counselor, Jesus has the experience to understand our situation. Jesus has been through it. He is fully human. Christmas reminds us that God left heaven. He left perfection and he came into the imperfect. He came and he took on flesh so that he could experience and know what it's like to be us so that he could help us through the things we encounter in life. Jesus has the experience to understand our situation. But secondly, Jesus has the wisdom to work out the problem. Jesus has the wisdom to work out the problem. Jesus said he was gonna to return to heaven, but he was gonna send the Holy Spirit. And he said the Holy Spirit would come and he would live and he would indwell every single believer giving you access to him and access to God the Father. He would help you understand God's word. He would help you make decisions. The Holy Spirit lives within us so that we can follow God in real time. Any moment, any day, any situation, you can call out and you can talk to God through the Holy Spirit and ask him for wisdom, for insight, for direction, for, for what you should do, how you should respond, you have access. Jesus, one of the terms, one of the, the titles given to the Holy Spirit who was to come is that of the counselor, that he would send the counselor, the Holy Spirit, who would give us wisdom to work out solutions for things we face in life. Finally, we, th this author said that as the wonderful counselor, Jesus has the power to change our situation or us. Jesus has the power to change our situation or us. What does the Bible say about Jesus' power? It says it's limitless. He is all powerful. Nothing is impossible for God, the Bible says. Jesus has all power to change situations and circumstances. And sometimes Jesus does. But at other times, the situations, the circumstances, or this is important, the consequences. You guys sometimes find yourself in the middle of situations and circumstances and things that are hard and you fully realize, man, I'm here by my own doing. I made this mess. Nobody else, I can't lay the blame, I can't. I, I am here because of me. And sometimes Jesus allows those consequences to remain, but he does this work within us, teaching us to trust him, to come to him, to be forgiven, to be strengthened and to get through whatever situation or circumstances or consequences we may be facing, even if they were of our own doing. And let's be honest about this. Most of us would much rather have God change the situation or circumstances than us, right? I'm like, God, why don't you take care of that? I like who I am, where I'm at. Just leave me be, change the things around me. But God doesn't always do that. Sometimes the greater and more important work is what we learn about God to learn to walk with him through difficult and hard things. And on that note, I want to take just a moment. We do this every year uh, at Geyer Springs. And so just thinking about hard things and difficult circumstances and, and hard situations, we recognize that the holidays are, are very difficult for people sometimes as you go through Thanksgiving into Christmas into New Year. Uh, we don't know what may have happened in this last year, but sometimes the holidays are hard because your situation is different and it's difficult right now. 
And so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask if you are celebrating Christmas and the holidays and things look different. We usually refer to this, things look different around your dinner table. Maybe you've lost a loved one this year and this is that first year cycling through the holidays without them. That's tough. That, that is hard. There's no denying that. So if you're here in that situation and want you to stand, we know that some of you, you, you may have experienced divorce this year. And so things are going to look different for you because the kids are somewhere or your spouse, your kids are here and the spouse, th- things are different. Maybe you're facing a deployment. You've got someone out their way. You know, that's coming in, in, in short order. Maybe it's a situation of health. Things are different this year because you, you're dealing with, you're grappling with some stuff. So I'm going to say, if you're Christmas looks different. There are some things that that are just making this not the easiest season. I'm going to ask you to stand around the room. We want to pray for you today. I want you to know that Jesus, as the wonderful counselor, is here to walk with you through these situations and circumstances. So if you're around the room, I see one standing back here. Any others? Is that seat? I'm going to ask you to stand. And church, here's what we do at Geyer Springs. We, we, we lay hands on people. We pray for them because we want to just physically say, God, we're setting this person apart for a special touch for your mere hands. So I'm going to ask if you would stand around these people. Let's, let's put a hand on these persons. We're going to pray for them right now in this moment right here as part of worship. So you gather around. You may not know the person, made the situation. That's okay. God knows every detail. He knows what's happening. Let's pray for them in this moment. Lord, as we pause right now, thinking about this name of who you are as the wonderful counselor and God, your power to meet us in any situation or set of circumstances that we may find ourselves in. God, we are thankful for that gift. We are thankful for the love that motivates you, Father, to meet us in those moments and in those situations. And Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the room right now, Lord, those who have stood Lord, we don't know all the details of their situation and circumstance. Maybe they have lost a loved one. Maybe it, it, it's uh, life situations or circumstances, other things of, of relational dynamics. We don't know the details, but Father, we do. And we know because of what your word teaches that God, your love for these people has not changed one bit. God, we know that you care for them with an everlasting love. Father, we know that your compassion, your concern for the situation that they're in, Father, it motivated you to come into this earth to experience things similar to what they're walking through so that God, you could meet them at that moment of need and bring whatever need it is into their life. So God, today we pray for peace. We pray for comfort. Lord, I pray for wisdom, for decisions they may be making. God, I pray for strength to face what may be lying ahead, things that are coming that way. God, whatever need it is in their life, I pray, Father, that you would make yourself known. You would touch them in that special way. Father, meet that need in their life. God, may they be reminded that you are indeed a wonderful counselor Lord, who is present to meet them where they are and to lead them into a future that will bring you glory and honor. Lord, I ask and I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And I wanna say to those of you that stood or maybe you didn't stand today, but there's something there. We have a tree just outside the venue off to the right. There's a tree that has these little ornaments on it. It's an anchor and it has the word Jesus on the bottom of that anchor, just to remind us that Jesus is an anchor in hard things. We want you guys uh, to pick one of these up to take with you. Have you placed this on your tree? As you see this both this year and years to come, to know that your church family is here. We love you, we care for you, we're praying for you, but also most importantly, to remember that Jesus will be with you this season and in seasons to come. So this is on the tree available to you in the lobby, in in the foyer there. So pick one of those up on your way today. But here's what I, just as we think about these difficult situations and circumstances and Jesus being a wonderful counselor, here's what we must remember, we must recognize. Jesus is moving in the lives of these people. These situations and circumstances are difficult. Maybe they lost a loved one. That, that's not gonna be undone in their situation or circumstance. That's the work that God has to do in their heart to bring peace and comfort and strength for them. And Jesus does. He walks with us through everything that we face in life. And the Bible says he's able to do this. He's able to bring beauty 
from ashes. That's what the wonderful counselor does as he meets us, as he works in our lives to increase our dependence upon him. I want to wrap up today to have you remember three short things. The first is this, as we think about Jesus as the wonderful counselor, remember Jesus meets us where we are. Jesus meets us where we are. The Christmas is about Jesus leaving the wonderful area of heaven, the presence of God himself and entering into the world, not just entering into the world in general, but in a very stinky, dirty place. I mean, let's just acknowledge this. Being born in the manger, uh, that's an animal barn. And we sanitize it and make it look all neat and cute and trendy to put on our our, our mantles at home. But y'all, it was dirty and it was smelly and there were animals around doing all the things that animals do. My least favorite job growing up uh, in my teen years, living in the country, working on a farm was cleaning out the cow barn every summer. Oh, I hated it. I would look for any reason, any excuse to not have to go do that. It was miserable. And guys, Jesus left heaven to come into the world to meet us where we are. Not to cheer us on from afar like a parent running track going, you go son, daughter, you run. You. Jesus came to where we are and did it with us, for us. He meets us where we are. So remember that as you think about the wonderful counselor. Secondly, remember this, Jesus understands. Jesus understands. I so want you to know that Jesus is here and he's available and he gets it. Think about these things. Have you experienced or maybe are you experiencing pain in your life? Jesus knows what that's like. Jesus experienced so much pain, physical, the the emotional with his disciples, seeing the, the hurt of his people. Jesus knows what it's like to have pain in your life. Do you feel lonely, feel rejected? Jesus gets that. Remember, he came into town on Palm Sunday and they were cheering his name. And by Friday, five days later, they said, crucify him. And he was carried off and he was nailed to a cross. Jesus knows what it's like to feel lonely, to feel rejected. You struggle with temptation. Hebrews 4, Jesus was tempted in every way, just as as we are, yet was without sin. Jesus was tempted, but he overcame that temptation. And now he gives us everything we need to overcome temptation as well. You ever feel betrayed in life? People turned their back on you, left you alone. Jesus says, check mark. Can you say Judas, right? Peter, the disciples, all who left him, those closest with him, Peter, Lord, I'll I'll never, I'll never deny you. I'll die before I'll deny you. This is in the evening by morning the next day before the rooster woke up, he had done it three times. He couldn't even make it a matter of hours and he denied who Jesus was. We sometimes feel betrayed. Jesus, he knows what that is like. You experiencing loss, grief in your life. Isaiah said of Jesus, he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Jesus knows, he understands. I want you to recognize and just know Jesus understands. He cares and he is there. He is here, he is available for you to come to him. Jesus will meet you where you are. He'll help you process, go through whatever is there and take it and bring it to scripture and say, what does God's word teach on this topic? Loneliness, grief, sorrow, temptation. He's gonna bring you as a wonderful counselor to God's word, God's truth, and then help you, give you the strength to be able to live this out, to put it into practice and to live according to the plan that glorifies and brings honor to God. And then the final thing that I want you to to recognize and and understand here about Jesus is that Jesus gives us victory. Jesus gives us victory. He has the power over every situation, every circumstance in which we may find ourselves. Remember, Jesus' miracles were done in response to needs. People had needs. Jesus met those needs. You have needs. Jesus will meet those needs. He's a wonderful counselor. 
I mean, Jesus didn't just walk around like Oprah going, you get a miracle, you get a miracle, you get a miracle, right? People couldn't see and Jesus gave them their sight. They couldn't hear and he made them hear again. They couldn't walk and he strengthened their muscles and their tendons and their ligaments and they got up and they walked. And they didn't just walk, they jumped and they danced. People lost loved ones and Jesus resurrected them from the dead. Jesus is able to meet your needs. Whatever you have been through, whatever you are going through and whatever you will go through in the future, Jesus is sufficient to meet needs in your life. He gives you victory in those ways. The key to experiencing victory, two things though. One, you must surrender yourself. You must surrender yourself. We don't come to Jesus to, 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 Jesus to bargain and negotiate. No, we, we, we simply say, Lord, I have nothing to offer and I come to you. That throne of grace Hebrews talked about, we, we come to him. We don't bargain, negotiate. We, we simply come to him and there we receive mercy. We find grace, the author of Hebrews said. In the gospel of John, people came to Jesus, said they wanted to follow him. And Jesus said, if you're gonna do that, you want to have a life that that honors and serves me, you must be like a kernel of wheat. That's got to go into the ground and it must die. It'll no longer be a kernel of wheat. It's going to turn into a root ball and then a stalk and then branches and bear fruit. If it stays a kernel of wheat, it won't bear fruit. But if it dies to itself, it will bear fruit. Jesus said, we have to surrender our plans, our purposes, all these things to him. So we surrender and then we receive by faith. We bring it to him, we lay it down, and then we receive whatever it is that Jesus brings to us. Peace, strength, hope, comfort. Sometimes it's that we are obedient in the hard things. We go the hard path, we go the difficult way, just like Jesus did. Remember him praying, Lord, if possible, let this cup be taken from me. But then what did he say? Yet not my will, but your will be done. Sometimes Jesus will lead you into hard things. He will walk with you through hard things to bring you out on the other side, strengthened in your relationship, your walk with him, and in a way that will bring glory and honor to him. So as we come to a time of response and reflection today, I want to remind you that the greatest thing about the wonderful counselor isn't his advice, his counsel, his wisdom, his power to change things. It's him He is the gift because you get access to him. You get a relationship with him through what he did on the cross that you could be forgiven of your sins and made right. So today as you're here, I don't know what your need may be, but I want you to know that the wonderful counselor is available. So in just a moment, I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna sing a song of response. And here's what we're doing in the song of response. We'll have pastors available in the back. And first thing is this, if you've never given your life to Jesus in obedience and received forgiveness of your sins and salvation, Go and speak with the pastor and say, I want to nail that down today. Do not leave this place without surrendering your life to Jesus. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. You know why it says today is the day of salvation? Because we're not promised tomorrow. This isn't a decision to wait on for a month, for a year, for five years till you get things together. No, no, Jesus meets us where we are right here, right now. So if you need to place your faith in him, you do that today. But also, I don't know what situations or circumstances are in your life, but you may need a touch from the wonderful counselor. And you may want to come just to the front of the stage, the altar area here, just bow by yourself with your spouse, bring your family and just pray and say, Lord, we need you. We need you in this. Here's what's going on. God, you know, God, meet us here. Show us what we need to do, how we need to respond to these things in our life. So that'll be your invitation, our time of response today. Let's pray. Father, as we think of this incredible picture, this image of who Jesus is, this wonderful counselor that is made available to us, Father, we know that it's not because of who we are, because of any merit or worth or anything of value within us, but God, it is totally and completely because of who you are, because of your love for us, that Father, we are able to experience you in this way. So Lord, in this moment, in this time, if there's a decision that needs to be made today, some kind of response, I don't know what that may be. God, every person here is unique. They are individual, but God, you know, you know where we are. 
You know where we've been. You know what's coming our way. You know our needs today. So God, if there's anything that's holding us back, that's hindering us, God, I pray you help us cast that off today. Give us the strength, give us the courage to take steps of obedience today and receive whatever it is you have in store for us. God, you wanna give us mercy. We receive mercy. We find grace. God, we do that so you will help us in our needs, whatever our needs are today. God, meet us in that place. Help us go through these things to bring you the glory and the honor that you deserve. We pray this in Jesus' name.